Hi, I'm David Bar Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And I want to give a special thank you to Robert Mullen, who just gave the book a five-star review on Amazon.com. It says, This is a great collection. Geek's Guide got me into science fiction and fantasy short stories via Best American, Lightspeed, etc. This collection is probably the one I've enjoyed the most so far. The stories are interesting, accessible, and relatable, as an 80s kid. Here's hoping for more future releases from Geek's Guide Press. So big thanks again to Robert Mullen for that great review. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 509 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing season one of the Apple TV Plus series Severance. And this will involve spoilers for everything in the show, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Anthony Ha, making his 28th appearance on the show. He's a writer and longtime tech journalist living in Harlem. A chapbook of his short stories called Love Songs for Monsters was published by the small press Youth in Decline in 2014. And his fiction has also appeared in Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. He's the co-host of the podcast Original Content and the comics interview series Panel to Panel. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. I'm excited to be here. The next up, we've got Sarah Lynn Mishner, making her 25th appearance on the show. She's a trans-supporting Ravenclaw Trekkie maker feminist who writes at Medium and lives in Connecticut with a Renaissance engineer in a small zoo. So, Sarah, welcome to the show. Always happy to be here. And also joining us today is John Kessel, making his eighth appearance on the show. He's the author of novels such as The Moon and the Other and Pride and Prometheus, and short story collections such as The Pure Product and The Bomb Plan for Financial Independence. His collection, The Dark Ride, the best short fiction of John Kessel, will be out in June. So, John, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, David. I'm glad to be here. All right, so let's start off with Anthony and have you tell us about your expectations going into Severance. Um, I knew very little about the show except for the like core concept, which is an amazing concept and I'm sure we'll describe shortly. And I knew the, the cast and the fact that like Ben Stiller was directing it. Um, so I had high expectations just from that. And because a few people had told me that it was going to be a good show, but it really had no sense of where the show was going. I think even initially, I thought it might be just a completely self-contained miniseries. Um, and, and so went in pretty unspoiled and, and was very delighted and surprised at, at almost every turn. Yeah. And so, so Ben Stiller, obviously a very well-known comedic actor. I mean, he was uh, the star of uh, There's Something About Mary, which I think is one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. I actually have to confess, I didn't know that he had directed as many things as he has, you know, just in preparation for this, I went and looked at his Wikipedia page and he's directed Reality Bites, The Cable Guy, Zoolander, Tropic Thunder, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. I mean, did, did am I just sort of late to the party? Does everyone else know that Ben Stiller had directed all those movies? I feel like I knew him as a director before I knew him as an actor, just because I remember, like I was into, I, I was totally into screenplays when I was homeschooled and I wrote a screenplay, an entire thing from beginning to end. And then I realized that I would have absolutely zero control as a writer in that industry. So I completely gave up and I've never regretted it. <laughs> but during that time, I was obsessed and I had a very extensive, you know, collection of movies and I loved things like Reality Bites. So there you go. And, and Anthony, you knew that... Ben Stiller directed all that stuff? Yeah, I um, I think was sort of vaguely aware of some of the kind of like Hollywood uh, kind of scuttlebutt about the sort of ups and downs of his career, like, you know, the cable guy not doing very well and things like that. But I, I think I became most aware of it after uh, around the time that The Secret Life of Walt Walter Mitty came out and there was a long New Yorker profile about his uh, ambitions as a director and some, sometimes thwarted ambitions, given that I think he wanted to make, he often likes to make these fairly big budget and elaborate uh, 
productions, which is not necessarily the, the favorite approach, particularly for comedies. Yeah. Well, and when you say, Anthony, that you were, you know, excited by the cast, I mean, I, I like you, I didn't really, I just watched the trailer for this and I was like, oh, that looks like an interesting concept. So I didn't really know who was in it or, or anything going into it. So, but um, obviously I recognized immediately uh, John Turturro and Christopher Walken and, and people like that. But a lot of the cast was, uh, was sort of new to me. Um, but kind of what was your, what's your, what's your take on the cast or going into it? Uh, I, yeah, I think, I mean, certainly the big draw for me as far as the cast was Adam Scott, who has, you know, just basically been a pretty consistent and reliable presence on a a variety of things, but which I I love him the most from, from party down uh, a show that I just think is, is amazing. Um, There is going to be a revival that he's working on right now. Um, And um, he is just this sort of, I mean, generally has, has been working um, mostly in, in comedies and, and this is among other things, a comedy, but definitely it was a chance for him. It seems like to go uh, darker. And then um, Patricia Arquette, um, who uh, I, I wouldn't say that I've followed her career that closely, but she is obviously incredibly talented as well. And, and um, there were like a number of other faces like Yul Vasquez, who was the, uh, who, who I remember fondly from, from Russian doll. So it's not like, a totally star studded cast, but there are some like recognizable names there as well as I think a number of people like faces that, that people will, will recognize even if they don't necessarily know the actors. Yeah. So then, so Sarah, say more about what were your expectations going into this show? I was pretty much sold uh, as soon as I saw the preview and, you know, recognized that it was going to be about workplace anxieties definitely got the vibe that it would be uh, sort of, parody of some of the experiences that I had in the Silicon Valley work culture emphasis on cult. Uh, And you know, you know how I've said this before, I'm all about cults, I find them fascinating, and especially cults that are sort of integrated into society and accepted as normal and not treated as cults. So I was totally on board. It was funny, I just went back and listened to the beginning of our devs panel. And you were talking about how your partner (laughs) was in this like top secret Apple group where, oh, yeah. and, and, and you oh, were saying like how much it was like devs, but I was listening to it. I'm like, that's even more like uh, severance, you know? Yeah. Do you want to just <laughs> like funny, refresh people's... Apple made the Apple made the thing, but actually, I mean, the thing about Apple is that he actually, Jason, my partner had the, one of the best work experiences of his life at Apple because, you know, they, a lot of Silicon Valley companies sort of talk the talk, but they don't necessarily walk the walk. And with Apple, it's like, you know, they really, for instance, care about um, diversity in the workforce. They don't just care about the pre- the appearance of diversity, right? And so he had a bunch of really talented female bosses, for instance, and the whole time he was there, that kind of thing. So, you know, but his, his, his Apple is very much about work culture. I think that they just are grounded enough and maybe it's because they've been around long enough. Maybe it's because they're kind of the quote, think different company. And I feel like in a lot of ways, they sort of are the company that other Silicon Valley companies are trying to emulate. Um, But they, they do it, they do it well. Uh, yeah. But yes, well, no, there I, I, are definitely some things that came off as culty <laughs> from a from a you know uh, outsider perspective. Yeah, no, I, I don't mean to imply that Apple is an evil corporation like in this TV show, but just the thing about how Jason, um, how he basically had to agree to do this job, not knowing anything about what he would be working on, you know, and, oh, yeah. and everything. And like, I still don't know. I still don't know. I mean, he's, he hasn't worked there in, in several oh, wow. years now. I still have no idea what he was working on and it, it hasn't come out yet. And he, every now and then I'll talk to him about it and he'd be like, well, if it ever comes out, I'll be able to point <laughs> at it and say, that's what we were working on. <laughs> but actually also, Sarah, speaking of Apple, because you, you said to me a little while ago that you thought I was uh, neglecting the Apple TV plus shows. So, um, and this I'll, I'll say, this is like my favorite show of yeah. the last probably year or two or something. I mean, I, I think go, you would have to go back to something like Devs or um, Dark on Netflix or something for, for something yeah. I liked as much as this. But do you, do you think that this is the best Apple TV Plus show or is there a whole constellation of great shows? They, they really, they're doing such a good job. I mean, I, I was, somebody, somebody was complaining the other day on the internet about how many streaming platforms there are and they're like, oh, I can't do another one. It's like, 
even if, I mean, first of all, if I had limited income and I had to worry about, you know, not signing up for too many of those, I would just cycle them through and binge an episode, you know, binge a whole show and then quit and start up another, you know, network and binge those shows and then quit and cycle them. But I, you know, if I had to choose one uh, streaming platform and only one, I would probably choose Apple Plus because they've just done so much great science fiction, especially. And, uh, you know, they really are are just doing so many different projects. So this is definitely one of my favorites, but it's really hard for me to pick a favorite because they're, they're what, just doing so much good stuff. What are some of the other, like a couple, just a couple of the other science fiction ones that they've done? I really love the Foundation series. I have a soft spot for C. Um, even though, you know, there's, it's a weird show, uh, and it has definitely been critically, you know, having uh, definitely a lot of mixed, uh, reviews about that show. Um, and obviously it's not science fiction, but Ted Lasso has my heart, my whole heart. I love it so much. What, what is that C? What, what is that? Uh, C is the, uh, Jason Moma, uh, a post-apocalypse one where everybody loses sight at some point and society breaks down. And so it's this whole organization. It, there's a lot of tribalism, uh, you know, of societies that have sort of, you know, uh, they have different forms or different ways of approaching language. They have, uh, you know, because they can't see, they have strings. And then the sighted among them are seen as outcasts. Um, and the people who can see in that world are basically uh, treated as, you know, uh, to be witches, to be burned at the stake, basically. I, I didn't even heard of that. So I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. Um, it's, but I- it's awesome. Okay, cool. And I want to get John in here too. So John, what were your expectations going into Severance? I had not heard anything much in advance of it. I I saw uh I I have had a, you know, Apple TV subscription and I'm a big fan of Ted Lasso, watched the foundation and I saw I saw the preview and it, it looked intriguing to me. The premise is basically it. And of course I I knew uh Adam Scott. I was a fan of that show uh Part Party on um uh, and uh and so uh, that was that was uh, another reason to watch it, but it really was the premise that got me, uh, and I didn't really know much of anything going into it. I, I had not even seen in advance that uh, Turturro or Christopher Walken were in the show, so when they showed up, uh, that was that was something of a surprise to me, a uh, pleasant one. So uh, yeah, uh, and it's the, the the show premise is sort of right up my alley, as I like science fiction that is you know set in the in what purports to be the present day and has some kind of odd sensibility uh you know kind of kafka s twist and uh, and that happens in my short fiction and and so really i felt i had high hopes especially after the first couple episodes and um uh, you know i wanted to hope that they would carry it off through the whole season uh and and well i guess we'll talk about that uh, but uh, so so I d- didn't know anything in advance much. But once I started watching it, I was very caught up. After we watched the uh, the first episode, uh, I said to my wife, "This is this is one of the smartest shows I think I've seen in um, a long time." And I rank it at least through this first season as highly as I do things like Breaking Bad. Okay, I really think it's classic. But we'll see how it works out. I said yeah. the same thing about the first season of Lost too. So <laughs> that did that did not pan out. So they they have space to to tank, but I hope they don't. Well, yeah, and I I think the premise is brilliant. I mean, so so let's just say that, so the premise is that there's this corporation and they're doing some sort of secret project, and in order to work on the secret project, you have to have this chip implanted in your brain where it severs your work life from your home life. And so you, you know, you go into work and the chip activates and then you don't remember anything from before you came into work and then you work the whole day and then you go home and the chip deactivates or activates again or whatever. And then you don't remember once you've left work, you don't remember anything that happens at work. And so it it essentially divides your your life into your your work life and your home life. And it's almost like you're two different people who have no knowledge of what the other one is doing. And and I agree. This is a, this is such a great idea, and it seems like an obvious enough idea that you would think that it would have been explored in science fiction before. And I feel like you know there must be some cyberpunk or something that that has done this, but I, I couldn't think of any examples specifically offhand. So I'm just curious if anyone can 
can anyone just offhand think of any any time they've seen this this sort of basic idea used before in science fiction? I've read an awful lot of science fiction over the years, and I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. Actually, uh, you know, maybe there is something out there, but I, I don't I don't know uh, that I've ever seen this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, like I think everyone has said, it's, it's an idea that just immediately grabs your attention. Um, I guess I forgot to mention, so the, um, the creator of this show, uh, is Dan Erickson. Dan Erickson. And I couldn't find a lot about, I mean, his IMDb page doesn't list anything besides severance, basically. Um, well, I, 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 I'm very curious about him. I, I also, I think, uh, I saw that he didn't have any credits that I was familiar with, and so I, I think, whoa, this guy is coming out of nowhere. I'm, I really am very curious about him, and he should get a lot of credit if he's, he's the guy who really came up with this. Yeah. So I did find a bio from the Austin Film Festival from a couple of years ago, and it says basically, it says he's a filmmaker based in New York City, and he's, um done what i think two feature films that looks like just sort of played at festivals and stuff and he's also worked as a film editor on some stuff including the upright citizens brigade um but it's yeah it's basically coming out of nowhere as far as i can tell and he just um he wrote the pilot script as a uh you know it's like a spec script just to, you know like, like how it works in hollywood generally is that you write you write scripts to show that you can write and then they they don't make that they hire you uh, to work on some show that they're already making or that they already have uh, in development or whatever. And so he was just sending the script around and he sent it to Ben Stiller's uh, production company and Ben Stiller read it and was just kind of like, well, that's screw it. Let's do it. You know, he's like, oh, I, I guess it, it was on something called the, the blood list, which is like the blacklist more for science fiction and horror or something. Oh. <laughs> um, but um and so Ben Stiller said to him when they met, Ben Stiller says, you know, this is the kind of script that usually people would say, like, oh, this is great, but we're not going to make it. We're going to do something else instead. He's like, but like, fuck it. Let's do it. It's good. Let's let's just do it. <laughs> and um, and so, yeah. And, and so and Ben Stiller spent five years, you know, this has been in development for five years. So I don't know if it's sort of distinctiveness, you know, was kind of a hurdle to getting it actually off the ground or not or what was going on there. But um. Yeah, it's it's just whatever happened there obviously worked out great. Um I know Anthony, do you know, do you know anything more about any do you have anything you could add about any of that or No, that that's my sense as well. I mean and, and certainly to, to echo your point about kind of how it normally works, you know, I have a few friends who are T V writers and it is very much like they I've read, you know, like pilot scripts that they've read they've written and thought they were great, and it's always like, Oh, but of course, this won't get made. This is just, you know, so I have another sample um, to like get jobs in uh, writer's rooms. Like the, the, you know, the, the idea that you would just sort of pick up someone's spec pilot script and turn it into a show is incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, and so that, but in this case, I mean, again, I don't know exactly how close the uh, original pilot script is with the pilot that we watched, but it like it this this absolutely deserves it like that that i mean that's such an amazing story the fact that i mean it's almost like i don't want to know too much about him because it's just that he's the idea that this you know just this voice kind of just emerged fully formed is is amazing yeah and i mean yeah I'm, well that's a fair point though that in five years of development this might have changed a lot from that initial spec script i mean i don't i don't know but um uh, it is sort of encouraging, though, to think that they've had five years to think about this. You know, it's not like uh, like Lost or something where they 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 made the pilot and then it actually got picked up and they're like, crap, now we have to <laughs> have to write the rest of the, you know, like figure out what what the hell is going on here. And <laughs> it never really did. Um, but uh, yes. But so let's talk about our our main characters. So. Um, so, Sarah, why don't you why don't you introduce us to our our four main characters uh well first you have mark who is played by adam scott and you have the whole like he is the one who um his wife died uh in an automobile accident a couple years past and so he decided to get severed because he wanted to spend eight hours a day not grieving um and you can you know they did a really good job of showing the different reasons why people might find this kind of thing attractive. 
Um, and then you have Heli, who uh, is sort of the new hire. And she replaces a guy who left and they don't really explain what happened to the, you know, it's part of the mystery, I guess, of the first couple of episodes, what happened to her replacement. Um, uh, well, to, to the guy she replaced. She was the replacement. Yeah. Um, and then you have uh, Irving and that's John Turturro's character. Um, and then, and he's sort of like really in love with the company. He's sort of that guy who is a hundred percent bought whatever is going down and is, you know, thoroughly uh, Stockholm syndrome, I guess, to the <laughs> cult. Um, and then you have Dylan, who is really all about the perks. He is there for the waffle party and, uh, you know, the bizarre swag and everything, the sort of corporate uh, lifestyle perks that come with things that he's gotten unnecessarily obsessed with. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's the yeah. Main. And Dylan, he's also sort of an angry person. Um, yeah. And you know, there's there's a couple really obvious uh, reference points for this movie, and one of them is Office Space, the the Mike Judge movie from the yeah. '90s. And he this he reminds me so much of the Michael Bolton character from from <laughs> Office Space, who's just kind of always sort of simmering, you know, simmering with rage. Yeah. Um. And so and so, Sarah, what did you did you like these characters, or like kind of what was your initial? Uh, sort of reaction to Yeah. Them. I really liked Helly. I feel like Helly is the person that I identified with the most. Um, you know, like the, the, you know, I think you could tell that a lot of the other characters dealt with uh, being thrust in this world in their own way. And, you know, you almost imagined that they were sort of socialized to it because you realize that they, they can't get out. Uh, and you wonder you know, what were the other reactions of the other characters when they first started? Did they also try to rebel? Um, but because we don't see that, we are, you know, sort of seeing it from Heli's perspective. She's the one who is sort of like, it, very early on, this is crazy. I don't want anything to do with this. I want out. I want to quit. <laughs> um, and, you know, especially initially that in during one of the first couple episodes, it provides a, a, a good amount of comic relief because it's a very anxiety inducing show in a lot of ways. It's, it's very unsettling. And so her being able to just sort of have the normal person's reaction of you guys, this is fucking nuts. Uh, it was, I think, a really important storytelling tool. Yeah. And actually, let me just emphasize, like I gave a spoiler warning at the beginning, but let, let me just say like, yeah, this is my favorite show from the last year or two. And I, I strongly if you're listening to this without having watched it, I, I urge you to go watch it before listening to the rest of this, because this is a show that really benefits from from you not knowing what's coming. Yeah. Um, but also, Sarah, I want to say, because, you know, you mentioned uh, you, you were talking about Silicon Valley culture, emphasis on the cult. And this show really takes that and cranks it up to 11. So can oh, yeah. you tell us about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so many of my experiences there. I think that that in general... I mean, having come from, I came to Silicon Valley in my uh, mid thirties, I guess, from New York and from Maryland and very much on the East Coast, very much an East Coast girl. And it was a culture shock. I mean, my first interview with a startup, they offered me ecstasy that night. And, you know, and it, it's just sort of like the lines between your work life and your personal life are very blurred there in in strange ways. Um and so there are so many things that I could say about this show in connection to my experiences there. Um, you know, like I used to work at an advertising agency in uh, in the Presidio in San Francisco. And there were it was very much that place where like during my interview, they were like, oh, you know, we like they were selling the company to me. They weren't asking me questions about myself or my work history. They were selling it to me, which I thought was very odd. And they had no hierarchy. So I had no idea if I was even applying for a junior or a mid level <laughs> position, stuff like that, which becomes important when they're like, so what are your salary expectations? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, because you haven't <laughs> said what I will be doing. <laughs> um, and on my 10th day there, you know, I was there for about 10 days and I was hired on spec. They were like, if we like you, we'll keep you fine. I've always, I've been in that position before and I've always been kept. I didn't, have any qualms about that but my roommate actually said and my roommate uh who spent a long long time in silicon valley was like you know one thing they do is they'll hire three people for the same job and fire two 
And I'm like, wait, what? Why would they, why would they do that? And they're like, and he's like, it's a thing that happens all the time. And I was like, okay. So for the 10 days I was there, they were like, oh my God, you're doing such an amazing job. We like you so much. Um, and then on the 10th day, they were like, so we've decided not to keep you. And they were very cheerful about it. Like I was devastated uh, because I really wanted to work at this company. And, you know, the guy was just sort of joking around about it as if it was no big deal. And it was incredibly dehumanizing. It was an incredibly dehumanizing experience. Well, and what you're saying about like the like weird, fake, ch- constant cheerfulness is something that this show really oh my God. down on. The yeah, Natalie like, character was straight up triggering. I was like, oh my God, I hate Natalie. I hate the Natalie character so much. I know the Natalie character. I hate her guts. She's a terrible person. <laughs> you know, like the whole the whole fake cheerfulness is a really, and I feel like the main difference between East Coast and West Coast work culture is that on the East Coast, people are kind of standoffish in the beginning and slow to trust. But as soon as you are welcomed into the fold, it's very genuine. and in California, the opposite. It's everybody's super cheerful, super fake. We'll hug you without knowing you. We'll do all sorts of welcoming, lovely things. And they all act like they're a family. And then they will straight up stab you in the back while smiling and laughing about it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and, and, and I, so I don't this, recommend it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and so this, this show really, you know, really obviously is sort of riffing off of that. But And I want to get John in here. What did you think, John, of the sort of cult-like aspect of this company uh that we've seen. I, I i really uh uh liked it uh you know it makes me i mean one of the things that's interesting is we watched the whole season and we still don't know what they do at this corporation uh yeah. you know the the at the desks the, the cubicle hell that they're working at they're they're so, sort of where they're they're rounding up bad numbers and and putting them in <laughs> they're removing them and it you know i, I keep thinking was well, this a metaphor or is this connected to some other thing you know uh the whole idea of the uh yeah, the 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 cult and and uh, you know the 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 great founder and and all that stuff is really uh, intriguing to me. It reminds me actually of uh, uh, of Kafka with uh, the trial or or the castle where the castle you know you no know, there are these people in the castle who are running things and you never get into the castle. You don't know who they are, what they're doing up there. Uh, and so I'm af- I don't know if uh, you know if Erickson had any of that specifically in mind, but uh, there's a lot of metaphorical stuff going on here that is very interesting to me. I want to point out a detail that I noticed that I don't think any I've seen anyone else comment on. Uh, the license plate on uh, on um, Mark's car and also on uh, uh, the car of uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Koble, uh, um is, uh, is not, not a, a state that we know. And uh, in the middle, uh, it has, uh, you know, three letters and then three numbers. And then in the middle, there's a little uh, face. And it's the face of, of Keir Egan, the, the founder of the corporation. And then there's a slogan at the bottom of the plate, like they have in a lot of license plates, like live free or die. Or, you know, North Carolina, where I live, it's called, it's first in flight, it says on every plate. Well, on, on, the, on the license plate of, of, uh, of, of the state, it says... Uh, remedium nominosis, which is Latin, and it means uh, s- spiritual remedy or divine remedy. And I don't know what the fuck that's about, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know really uh, what that what that is connected to, if anything. But I thought, wow, they did this. This it don't, the only way I could see this is by s- pausing the video and and focusing in on it. But uh, uh, in the last episode, if you follow uh, where where uh, Ms. Cobell is is driving rapidly through the town, there's a, s- a shot of the back of her car, and you can you can see this. Uh, uh, so so I don't know what that that's about, but I, I it's fascinating to me. Well, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because this takes this doesn't take place in our timeline apparently. I mean, this takes place in some sort of like alternate universe. It seems because you know. Um, it's from what we gather, this is about the present year. You know, if you look at like what years the previous CEOs served and stuff like that. But the tech, but the like, it has a very seventies vibe. Like all the furniture and the the technology is a lot more analog than you would expect it to be and stuff like that. And so, right. yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. It, 
No, that I mean, it, I think that there are lots of things like, and then they may never really, uh, you know, offer explanations for all this stuff, which I'd, I'd be all right with, uh, as long as the one of the things I really like about the st- story is how much they seem to have thought about. And that really pleases me when when they they have a premise and they follow through on all the implications of the premise, and a lot of them I hadn't thought of initially. They 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 bring. Uh, bring up. And I, th- I thought that was, uh, that's really, it gives me a kind of a reassurance as I watch it, that the people who are doing this are, are, are smarter than I am. And that's good. <laughs> I'll say about, so, so yeah, so this, this company or like cult or whatever you want to call it was, was founded by this guy, Keir Egan. And it's, it, there's been several generations of his descendants have served as CEO. And he has this, uh, this sort of weird philosophy where he believes that all people are sort of combinations of these four humors and this you know this is like like the four humors from like greek science philosophy whatever but they're they're different so his are woe frolic dread and malice and he thinks that everyone is some combination of these and that these are these need to be tamed with the nine virtues and i won't read the whole list but it's like humility and vision and verve um and so there's this um this painting that we see near the beginning of the show where it's uh keir egan with a like a cat of nine tails, like a whip, like whipping these four figures who represent the four, the four humors. And I didn't catch this myself watching it, but just from, from, from reading up on fan theories and stuff, when they're sorting, when they're sitting at their computers, sorting the the numbers, they're actually sorting them into folders that correspond to woe, frolic, dread, and malice. So like, does this number scare you? Does it make you angry? You know, that's, that's what they're doing is they're, getting these feelings from the numbers and sorting them into the corresponding folder. So I have no idea really what to make of that in particular, but um, that's, that's sort of one of the things that's going on there. Um, so uh, I want to get back to Anthony. So Anthony, so there's a couple of characters we haven't really talked about yet. So tell us about uh, the boss characters at, uh, at this company. Sure. Uh, so the, probably the, the supervisor the team interacts with the most is, uh, I guess I'm, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page right now. His name is Seth Milchik, but they all just call him Mr. Milchik. And he is, um, you know, very outwardly friendly, but that there's this sort of sense of, of menace um, underneath that. And so there's like, even when he's being really nice, there, there's something kind of off and, and intimidating about his demeanor. Um, he's often the one who is responsible for uh, like when they get the perks and the rewards and their, you know, strange little parties, he's the one who's throwing the party. Um, But he is also the one who often is, is punishing them in the break room uh, when, when, when that's called for. Um, And then kind of above him. Well, actually, why don't you explain the break room? Sure. Um, I, I, and I'm, I'm still not a hundred percent sure about all the different mechanisms of, of the break room, but it's something that sort of everyone talks about in these hushed, frightened tones. And then when you, when we finally see it, the characters kind of walk down this long, dark hallway. Um, they sit down, uh, and, and usually it's, it's Mr. Milchick, although I get the sense that other supervisors will sometimes take on this role. Um, and they have to read this sort of long apology um, and they basically have to just keep reading it until they actually mean it. And so that uh, I think the first time we really see this in action, like Helly goes in and it takes her thousands of time, like more than a thousand times ultimately before the, he accepts her apology. Um, and, and it's also this, it's I think sort of made additionally nightmarish because of the nature of severance means that even though the, you know, she, Helly as a person or as a, as a body gets to uh, leave the, the office and go home for the night, um, Helly, uh, the, the severed um, consciousness, basically she just leaves, like she remembers getting into the elevator and then it just starts again. And so she's just, um, in the break room forever, potentially until she, uh, un- until she's actually, you know, reached a state of, of convincing remorse. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the innies they're called, there's like the innies and the outies right. and the outies are the, the people, the consciousness in the outside world and the innies are the consciousness 
in in the on the severed floor. The innies are are essentially trapped at work forever, as far from their perspective. You know, this is like a, a work day that will never ever end. It will go on for the rest of their lives. I thought that that was a really well developed how how you come to realize. Oh well, these are are people, separate people whose entire lives are spent in in this in this workspace. They never get outside the building, and uh, you know it, it is a it is a vision of hell. Uh, it's 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 horrifying, and and the the uh, the uh, uh, wonderful little bits that they they work from this because their their consciousness changes when they leave the you know the severed floor uh or, or pass through certain doors or get on the elevator uh you have that that bit where Helly is trying to escape and she oh, runs okay. out through a, a door into the stairwell and then she just turns around and comes back in because once she goes out the door she's not Helly anymore or well, she's not the Helly who, the innie she's the Audi and the Audi do- doesn't want her to to leave and so she just comes back in and so it, she can't leave i mean it's not like she's physically prevented from leaving but but uh uh the that uh, you know, uh, she, her consciousness ends at, at the door. And that, right. that to me was uh, wonderfully well thought out, I thought. It was really, really clever uh, to the point where she tries to tell her, tries to tell her Audi, you know, uh, how awful it is working there. And in order to do that, she breaks a, a, a window in the doorway and sticks her head out so that uh, and with a note so that 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 her Audi would see this this note uh, uh, and know this uh, this truth about what's going on in there. I, I, anyway, I, I I thought that was a yeah a very cleverly done. Yeah, that thing with the hallway was was definitely one of the most memorable spooky parts of the show. Um, and how, how about Sarah? You want why don't you tell us about uh, Ms. Cobell? This is the other major character we haven't gotten to yet. Oh, she's wonderfully creepy. <laughs> So Patricia Arquette does a fantastic job in this in this show. Like she's she plays, you know, basically two different characters, but she intentionally has, um, you know, she isn't severed. So she intentionally just has two identities and two different names um, because she's, I guess, higher high enough up at the company that she can do that. Um, and her work persona is this very creepy, rigid um a very obsessive person and then her neighbor persona and she is mark's neighbor um he of course does not know or does not understand that his boss is this sort of she comes across as like a crazy cat lady you know like she, she sort of dresses completely differently than her other character and uh, so it's a really wonderful uh you know, performance by Patricia Arquette because she sort of captures both sides of this very unsettling, unnerving, crazy person um, and, you know, just does an amazing job. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so that's basically the setup. And so then um, the show is this really interesting mix of a comedy, a satire and a thriller. Um, and, and so so in the thriller plot, basically, you have these these characters, these innies at work. Um, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They kind of, they want to leave. And, um, and we see Mark on the outside. Uh, he's the only one of the four main characters that we see what his outside life is like initially. And he's contacted by this, this person, this, this, his best friend from work who on the outside world, he doesn't remember, but we gather this PD, but we, we, so, so we sort of gather that there's this, um, there's this uh, sort of movement to to ban severance, to to ban this technology, and you know, so he has to sort of decide whether to get involved with that or not. Um, he also we he has a uh, a sister who's pregnant, and her uh, husband who's a sort of like pompous <laughs> uh, author. That I don't is know. So He's weird. Like... <laughs> He's like, he's like guy. yeah, a sort of motivational yeah. speaker kind of guy. Um, I don't know if anyone. What, what did people think of those those characters? He, the, they were they were like like the really dark version of Spencer and his salons that he. I'm talking about how I met David. Um, we have a very intellectual friend who has like these lovely salons at his apartment where he brings people together to specifically talk about, uh, you know, like 
uh, art and ethics and and rationality and things like that. And so when I say that this is the dark counterpart to that, I am, am being very deliberate uh, because uh, like the first time we see them, they're having a dinner party in which nobody eats dinner. They just have empty plates <laughs> as a thought experiment. <laughs> and the whole thing is just really pretentious and weird. And all of their friends are weird. And, you know, it kind of works out like you, it, it's a it's it's it really blends well with the themes of the show because you know they're they're talking about sort of how these our interpersonal relationships um have these structures to them as well and people who like to mess with those structures and question them um but often that doesn't necessarily happen in a healthy way um so it works it's very weird but it they're a, a very strange couple and and weirdly enough devon the sister you're kind of like why are they together because she's obviously really yeah. annoyed by rick and most of the time but well she seems much more down to earth she's sort of <laughs> yeah. um, right humoring him <laughs> yeah yeah and his, his thought- book his book was hilarious. Uh, yeah. The quotes, yeah, uh, his advice for people, um, uh, some of it was just, you know, it's complete nonsense, uh, and, but, it was, but he's completely serious about it. And so that that was really funny when they had quotes, uh, when Mark is reading this book and and uh, we have the voice of of, uh, of these um, from the book of, of what, what he's advi- advising. Yeah. Yeah, it's this very vacuous, platitudinous sort of uh... – self-help kind of stuff and yeah um, and and that was such a great addition because these people are basically children right because if you've been removed from your memories you are basically a kindergartner who you know has the ability to type and so they are showing with that with little touches like that 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 these people are uh very ripe for manipulation because they are they are blank slates they can be written upon they can be ordered around they can be very easily manipulated uh so that was a really important part right they're basically the ideal worker in american yeah. capitalism <laughs> yeah <laughs> well and, and it's like there's i'm not sure where the show where if anywhere the show is going with this but there's sort of a weird parallel between rick and the brother-in-law and Kier egan the founder of this company where they both have these sort of you know this this sort of philosophy and both have sort of gathered these childlike followers around them and stuff like that so <laughs> i'm not sure exactly where where that's going but it's yeah it's Ideologues. obviously <laughs> although i think one of the things that's worth sort of underlining about the role that Rickon plays in the story is that then his book uh for sort of convoluted reasons actually ends up in lumen and so all the um you know, the the workers in this department, macro data refinement, all our main characters end up reading it, um, particularly Mark and Dylan, and treating it as this sort of like new gospel. And that's how we get a lot of the ridiculous stuff. But to them, it's the most amazing revelation because they exist in this world without um, any real like written text. In fact, I think that's like one of uh, Kier's commandments is that there should be no other like books or anything down there. Um, and, you know, as much as it's sort of easy to make fun of, and I think it's, it's meant to, Rickon's advice is meant to be um, in, like really dumb and, and silly and laughable. It is actually really helpful to them because the, you know, David, you were talking about the, the this thriller plot of them wanting to get out. But actually, I think the first step of that is also a lot of them, except for Heli, who knows this from the beginning, I think the rest of them kind of have accepted their fate and it hasn't even occurred to them that they might want to get out and finding this book and particularly this passage about the whole idea that actually your boss, uh, you know, you shouldn't just be grateful to your boss, but you should see that your boss is somebody who needs you even more than you need them is like this important revelation. Yeah. And so, so I watched the first four episodes of this and I thought they were basically flawless and then i still think the show is pretty much perfect but the the sort of middle i guess there's nine episodes in season one and somewhere around the middle i started having some um anxiety that this was going to be another lost or Battlestar galactica where they throw out all these intriguing mysteries and then you get to the end and the writers are kind of like yeah that was some weird shit huh like we don't know <laughs> what it means either um and so so in particular there's this scene where they uh, so 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 they 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 work in this sort of maze like complex of of bright white corridors and they don't know it's 
contours. Um, and they know that there's other departments working on other projects, but they don't really know where they are or how many people there are and so on. And so at one point, some of the characters, they've, they've kind of gone AWOL a little bit and they're wandering around and they, they happen by this room where there's this guy like nursing baby goats. goats. <laughs> and it's so weird that that was the part I was like, is this ever going to make sense? Like, is this ever going to be explained? So I'm just curious if any, like John, did you? Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I had moments where I mean, I, as I, I mean, the reason I brought up Lost is that's a show that I thought was had an idea of what it wanted to do, and it proved to, to be, uh, you know, a huge disappointment in the end. So uh, I'm hoping that they don't they don't fall prey to that. They, there are many things that they did seem to know about and think about in advance. So there were a number of things that played out in the last two episodes that they had set up from the beginning of the season. So so I thought that that was uh, that was reassuring. But yeah, the the guy feeding the goats with a baby bottle, I I have no clue. I, one of the other things that I wondered about uh, actually is I, I really like the idea that these uh, the innies are uh, naive and and therefore manipulatable. But but um, I wondered how much do they know about the outside world? I mean, do they have uh, they have the capacity to read, for instance? Uh, you know what 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 abilities that they have outside? Did they have every ability that they had outside? What do they know about yeah. the world out well, out there? You know, uh, I thought I, it I was think... like it was like just amnesia. It, it was like having amnesia, like the born identity or something, where you don't remember anything about y your your identity, but you know everything out you have all your other skills and general knowledge of the world right Dylan so, can still tie those really impressive knots <laughs> i right, love so, the moment when devon asked him to you do understand metaphor right <laughs> like she had to clarify because <laughs> right. she wasn't sure you know it's a fair it's a fair thing to ask yeah that's a good point uh so yeah she's she's wondering uh you know how much they do know uh, uh about the outside world but but so did everybody did did everyone were you were you just completely confident that the show knew where it was going or that were you enjoying everything or were there any like bumps along the road and throughout the season? I had, if I had to complain. It was yeah. I, I think that they I've, they know where they're going. Although don't explain the goats. I never want to know what's going on with the goats. <laughs> um, I think that if I did feel a little bit like it was kind of it, the the pacing slowed down a bit in the middle of the season, and I do wonder if there is an even better version of this that is just, a, again, the sort of one season and done narrative. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm hopeful and optimistic that they at least have answers to the big questions. And I think there are sort of smaller, strange things that, that don't need to be explained, and that's fine. Right, because cause I think everyone here was on our uh, pretentious movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... Like and I, I loved this show, but I could see like it, if I were to imagine someone who didn't like it, the fact that it's sort of overly quirky or overly, uh, you know, precious or something or a little pretentious or something like that might be. I can imagine someone having that. I feel uh, like it was criticism. just the right amount of art house. Like you, you mm -hmm. kind of want some with a show like this. It kind of demands it because um, otherwise, you know, you you want some of those sort of visual metaphors, but I can definitely see that if I, you know, I just posted on Facebook this morning about how I loved it and everybody should watch it. But at the same time, I'm like, I am well aware that there are very specific people who would absolutely not get this show and not enjoy it at all and be like, what the actual fuck? <laughs> so. Right. I, I saw a review where someone complained in the pilot that there's a scene where Mark is going to work for the first time that we see it and he walks through these featureless white hallways for 90 seconds with no no other people you know, there, there's nothing just the sound of him walking and the vision of him walking down the hallways and this person complained that you know this was this was wasted time why why <laughs> you didn't have to go on 90 seconds with that and and but to me it, you know that's sort of charming i mean i suppose if it, it could overstay its welcome if, you, if they push that kind of thing too far but but uh, I, I kind of like the idea that it really s sets you – see, you have – from years of watching television, we have these expectations about what you do and don't do in a in a series. And so this show is 
no, in small ways anyway, breaking our expectations. And I, I wouldn't, I don't mind that. Uh, you know, uh, it, so many other shows are so predictable. Um, and, and yet, you know, they, they, uh, the fact that, for instance, uh, uh, by the end of this season, we know pretty much why each of the four uh, innie characters, why their out outy characters, their outy personas, what want that wanted to have this job, or why that why they're there, and um, so that they they must have thought that out uh, in advance. Okay, uh, Helly in particular, I thought was was uh, well constructed. The, her reasons for being there. Um, uh, which were surprising, but but also uh, uh, made sense. Yeah, let's 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 not get into that right away. But I will say that I um, the only criticism of the show I really saw was one of my friends on Facebook kind of bounced off the first couple episodes and said the show just seemed dreary and like a very Hollywood picture of of, of office life. And I mean, like I said, I, I loved it, but um, I'm just curious if that criticism uh, resonates with anyone at all. I think you have to have been through dreary office in environments in order to understand that it's a feature, not a bug. Well, I, I, yeah, it's not a criticism for me, but it is interesting. Um, I guess particularly in light of you know some of uh, the comments that that Sarah in particular was making about kind of the parallels with the sort of cult like atmosphere in Silicon Valley, which I think is is certainly true, but that the sort of visual style is much is not about like the kind of Google Plex kind, you know, like brightly colored, all glass, open floor plan, um, uh, Silicon Valley ethos, but it, it is much more about this older style of work. It's about like how I imagine the, the offices that my parents went to look like. Um, and you're talking about the technology, um, just the, the, the fact that it is look a sort of a cubicle farm as opposed to just a bunch of desks, um, and I mean, I think there's sort of in world logic for that because it, you know, if, if you had, if we all had like laptops and we sat down and we could immediately get onto the internet, that would <laughs> kind of defeat the whole purpose yeah. of severance. But I think there's also a sort of, um, like emotional logic to it, that, that it's, it's, it, it's supposed to feel like this kind of dream of what, like this nightmare of what office life is, as opposed to like a realistic representation of what it's like now. Yeah. And they did a lot with symmetry and color to and lighting to do that. I mean, they it, it, there were so many intentional choices that as somebody who went to art school, I really appreciated, you know, just a lot of the framing was very symmetrical. You had a lot of shots where people go through very narrow, long hallways and they show the whole thing every time. But I honestly, I, I wouldn't want to remove any of that. And it, it has a, a, also an L, I mean, it, there's, Real, there's realism here, but uh, it's 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 surreal in, in in certain specific ways, and I think that that is to to its benefit. Uh, you know, there's that also that uh, element of where at work it's all under this bright, flat, white fluorescent light. Uh, there are no shadows, okay. Uh, whereas in the uh, outside, it's it's very dreary. It's in the middle of winter and cloud cover all the time. I don't know if I ever saw any sunshine in any of the scenes filmed outside. I think quite deliberately they 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 chose to do that. Um, um, yeah, it's almost always at night, actually, on, on the outside. I guess that, that makes sense if the out Audi people would be there in the evening, um, you know, all day they're at work. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, I guess let's let's get into some of the, the conspiracy. Like, so, so, yeah, like I said, there, there, there's this thriller conspiracy where, you know, greater and greater, you know, like like I think in any thriller, you know, like the, the, the tentacles of the conspiracy has to sort of reach up into – you know, centers of power and stuff like that. And so, so we, we basically, we sort of find out that, um, that this, this company, yeah, it sort of has its, its hands and everything. And, um, we, we get some idea of, we don't, we never really know exactly what the company's agenda is, but, but we, we gather that they want to make this, you know, sort of perfect the severance technology and share, share it very widely. Um, and so for example, uh, Mark's sister, she meets this woman who, uh, when, when they're they're pregnant together, they they have these sort of birthing cabins that they that they rent, and this this woman that she meets, this other pregnant woman, turns out to be a senator's wife, 
and um and when the sister runs into this woman later after the the babies have been born this woman doesn't remember her at all and so she sort of pieces together that that, that this woman that that the, the severance technology is being implemented outside of outside of women this company that um that one of the things that that's being used for is that very wealthy people who don't want to experience pregnancy can just kind of skip that and have a you know sort of an any have the any do that for them yeah it's, um, it's a really fascinating way to approach which what is a science fiction classic concept which is the idea of the underclass and how people are voluntarily splitting themselves in two so that their other half their lesser half uh mm-hmm. that they are you know they've decided is their lesser half uh can go do these other unpleasant things and that is obviously something that we've seen repeated in science fiction over and over and over again. You know, that who are the slaves um, who are the dispose, the group of disposable people. And so what this show is doing is, you know, creating that concept out of splitting yourself literally in two and having, you know, that side of yourself be something that you sort of kick aside like a, you know, like a dog. And it's, you know, it's, oh, it's really effectively unsettling. Right. And, and it's it's doing, you know, it's using science fiction. You know, it's not just like science fiction in the like reverse the polarity on the warp core kind of thing. But it's like, <laughs> you know, it, it, it like it, it's, it has such obvious metaphorical resonances with so many issues of, you know, class and, you know, capitalism, like Anthony mentioned and so on that, you know, that all these things resonate so much. Um, it has. It has moments, I think, of real uh, emotional uh, depth, which surprised me uh, somewhat because it, a lot of it is satirical, as you say. But uh, things like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Irving's uh, uh, attraction to Bert, <laughs> uh, in some ways that's comic, but it's not comic, and it's it's you know it's seen as a sincere need for another person, and and so these people who seem to be drones and you know cubicle drones are are really they have the capacity for an internal life. Likewise, Mark goes from being pretty much a, a you know a, a automaton in the co- corporation to uh, with re- as regards Helly Helly's appearance, she uh, you know they be, develop a relationship. And and so it's like it's sort of saying that that human beings, no matter how squashed they are by corporate or other bureaucracies, still have in them this, you know, this individuality, this uh, uh, this desire to to be more than just a drone. Uh, and I think you see that in all four of the characters uh, who are the main characters inside. Um well, Dylan, when he discovers he a little bit about his outside life, you know, sort of comes alive in a way he hasn't until then. Uh, and, and, and he he wants something that's not just a you know a, a, a corporate mug or a, a finger trap uh, to reward himself for for counting numbers. Right. I guess let's let's get into. I, I guess we should just. I'm going to give away some big twists. So again. Like I'm, I'm not kidding about the spoiler warning, but so yeah. So in the, um, I guess it's the finale, right? We find out that Helly is actually Helena Egan, and so she's sort of the heiress to this company, and she's gone. She's become severed to show to the outside world that this is so safe and so great that even she's willing to do it on herself. Um, and so, so this is in this uh, season finale is where we really see the outside world for for Helly um, uh, and um, Irving uh, for the first time in any sort of sustained way. Um, I guess oh, I should also explain there's this other big twist where Mark's wife, who we understand has died in a car accident, turns out to be this other sort of functionary at at Woman, um, Ms. Ms. Casey or Mrs. Casey or something who um she sort of gives them these um i don't know how to these sort of counseling sessions where she she speaks in a very soft voice and gives them encouraging uh you know encouraging statement blandishments um and we sort of get the idea that she never leaves um the the office she she has no audi apparently and so um so anthony what did you what did you think of all those sorts of revelations um, certainly the revelation with Helly, I thought was amazing. Um, and, um, 
I actually earlier today was listening to the interview you did with Maureen McHugh and you talk about this sort of writing dictum that ending should be uh, surprising but inevitable in retrospect. And that is like the sort of perfect example of I it did not occur to me that she could be. I mean, because the whole season um, you've been getting the sense that, you know, Hallie's uh, Audi must have these very specific and weird reasons um, for wanting to do this because um, even more than anyone else, uh, uh, Heli has made it very, very, very clear that she wants to get out of there and, and her Audi has shown nothing but like sort of contempt for, for her any and, and complete disinterest in her reasons and being there. Um, and then there's also this thing where at the very beginning you, that, that she's treated with this kind of, Heli is treated with this sort of unique respect or reverence by some of the staff. Um, and so finding out that she's part of the the family that runs, that is founded and, and always run Lumen um, just feels like the perfect explanation, even though I didn't, uh, it didn't occur to me beforehand. Maybe, maybe it did to other people. Um, I was less crazy about the revelation about Miss Casey. Um, par- I mean, I, I think it's one where we, we know so little of yet about where, uh, where that's going and what that's going to mean about Mark. I mean, certainly it suggests that, um, that these aren't just random people who have decided to come in here and are working on this project, but that Mark in particular in some ways was, was chosen or targeted for this program because if, you know, she's in there, then did they specifically stage her uh, death and and to, to sort of push it, put him into a position where he'd want to go down there? Is it just coincidental? I mean, there, there's sort of endless questions, but I I like Mark more as I'm more interested in Mark as just a guy who's gone through this experience and is like trying to sort of claw his way out of it as opposed to some sort of specifically important person in in this program. But again, we'll see where it goes. Right. Well, well, this is where sort of the thriller aspects and the, um, you know, the, the more character based stuff are maybe a little bit at odds. Like, do we, you know, we're, we're at least, you know, it's something that has to be balanced against each other, because if it goes too far into thriller territory, then it it sort of loses some of that. I don't know, emotional truth or whatever. I mean, the way I read the um, the Miss Casey situation is I, I my impression is that she uh, was in this car accident. And they and was probably, you know, brain dead or comatose or something. And they implanted a uh, a severance chip in her. And so she is only has an innie, you know, that uh, there is no Audi consciousness for her to transfer to. And that's why they kind of keep her in the basement and why she seems sort of zombie like and um, and everything. And, and we also it, it's pretty clearly uh, implied that they've wiped her memory a bunch of times, too. Um, cause she says that like, she's only, she can only remember about a hundred hours of work and that's her whole existence that they just bring her out for these counseling sessions. And she has no other existence apparently outside of that. Um, but, um, I don't know, John, what do you, what do you think about? Well, I mean, I mean, the one thing about, uh, Miss Casey being, uh, um, uh, was a Gemma was the name of his wife, uh, being the same person, um, is that it, it does seem to me to explain why uh, Miss Cobell was living next door to Mark outside. Uh, you know, I was wondering why the heck is she sort of spying on him outside? What what point is there to that? Uh, that is she, she's not doing it to the other employees. So, you know, what's that about? Well, not, it does seem now that there's some kind of thing going with uh, with uh, uh, Mark and and Miss Casey. Uh, I mean, she, she asks specifically uh, uh, his sister – uh, Devin, if uh, on the outside, whether uh, Mark has ever claimed to have seen his uh, uh, Gemma, his wife, alive, even though she's supposed to be dead, uh, and and so you know, that that fits in there too, is that she really wants to know whether uh, uh, the severance procedure is a hundred percent effective, or whether there are memories that linger to the point where you might recognize somebody uh, that you shouldn't be able to. Uh, so, so that that's set up there to be a, a, a plot element. I think that I'd be very surprised if they don't pursue that in the second season, uh, uh, because it, it is sort of left dangling to a degree. Uh, now, I, I I think your point is well taken that um, if it gets too far into this sort of 
thriller plot where, you know, there are all these uh, schemes going on that we don't know about, then it does uh, uh, undercut the human story of these people. Uh, I, I guess that sort of comes with the territory when you're doing a series of this sort. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it'd be a delicate balancing act to get that to all come come out all right. Mm-hmm. I guess the other thing I wanted to mention was that when Heli, so Heli meets her, I think it's her dad who's the current CEO of Lumen, James Egan, and he says all sorts of sort of weird stuff. But he says. Um, one of the key things is he says something like, uh, I can't wait till you're there beside me at my revolving. And yeah. Uh, yeah. we don't know what that, what that is. is. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it, it sounds, I, I think it's something along the lines of they're hoping to perfect the severance technology to somehow have immortality or transfer their consciousness around or, or something like that. He talks about, you know, wanting everybody to have a severance chip and then they'll all be cures children. I don't know if anyone has any uh, any other theories about what's going on with any of that stuff. I mean, it does seem very cult like. I I don't I I I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about that that aspect of it. Um, uh-huh. Nobody uh, nobody read up any, on any fan theories or anything like that. <laughs> I haven't gone to any of the fan sites. No. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have a lot of time. I just like just to, this morning. I was sort of trying to get caught up on on what fans have been saying but i I think like i don't think we really know a lot beyond what was revealed in the um finale at this point although they did release i don't know if people know about this they released this uh free ebook on apple books called severance the lexington letter where it's um the, the the premise is that it's you know there's there's some other character that we haven't seen in the show who was able to like smuggle information to their audi who then sent it to a newspaper and so then this is like that information and it's, it's mostly still um, pretty mysterious, but uh, I guess if you're, if you're curious about that, since, since nobody, I haven't read it either. So if none of us have read it, I won't spend too much time on it, but I'll just mention that that's, that's out there if anyone's curious. You know, uh, there's a whole aspect again of the, there seems to be a resistance or underground movement outside that is pitched against uh, uh, Lumen and Severance. Uh, that woman who uh, who meets with Mark and uh, um, also uh, um, the the head of security from Lumen who uh, uh, comes to a bad end. Uh, uh, and that, that whole thread is not really that, that clearly needs to be taken up at some point. I don't know again, what, wh- where that goes. Uh, I noticed that, that it talked about this university, uh, where, uh, I guess the severance procedure was perfected and uh, the woman said she installed these chips in people and so she can remove them. Uh, but it also, we know that Mark was a university professor, uh, before he worked at Lumen. So I don't know, you know, if that may fit together in some way. Um, it's funny, the, the things that s- s- strike me uh, as most memorable are often like little moments that are are often very funny, but also sad and creepy and poignant. Uh, like when... Um, uh, you know, PD leaves and and Mark gets promoted to be the the head of his little unit there, and uh, uh, Ms. Kobo uh, gives him a new you know key card or whatever, and and she says you know you you may request a handshake, and <laughs> uh, he he says well yes I'd like a handshake, and she just is like you know it's like she doesn't want to shake his hand. <laughs> the 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 moment is so. Uh, uh, cr- creepy i mean it's just really also that she's so not wanting to shake his hand and and uh uh the whole uh, i mean it sort of says everything about the the relation between the corporation and the and the employees at this place uh, um likewise the the scene where uh um Bird is retiring from his his unit, and they're having a, a going away party for him. And in the middle of the party, they put on a video to, or a video of of his Audi uh, saying goodbye to the uh, to, to the unit, and and he's 
he's saying, oh, you know, I'll miss you all, except I've never met any of you and I don't know any of you by name. Uh, and it <laughs> goes on at some length about about him saying goodbye to these people he doesn't know anything about. Uh, uh, that was hilarious, I thought. Christopher, Christopher Walken is is really good at that kind of deadpan humor. Yeah, I guess that that brings up one of the I guess one of my issues with this and is that, you know, the the innies, there's the, there's this sort of constant sort of idea that the innies are going to escape somehow. And it just seems I don't see any way that really works. That I mean it seems like, you know, if they even if they get the word out that this is this exploitative uh process and everything, it seems like if the severance program were shut down and they were the chips were turned off or whatever they would just all die in they effect die. the the innies right and so you know if their um if their agenda is basically like we would rather all be dead than at work for the rest of our lives like that makes sense but i, I feel like that idea sort of gets pushed to the backgrounds in the show where where it seems like they don't all just want to die it seems like they have some hope of escape and i'm not sure what it is exactly like what is their what are they sort of well, the, imagining is going to happen well the, Hallie, I mean, the two go ahead i mean Hallie literally literally attempts suicide which i i felt was totally believable right but did you feel like they all i mean do you feel like they're basically on a suicide mission or do you because I, I i get the feeling that they it just just like the, the fact that this is that we're on a suicide mission we're all in effect going to die if we succeed i feel like they don't spend a lot of time talking about that if that's really what's the yeah, they don't talk about the their goals in general. I think they, it seems like what they want is basically the, for people just to know that they're down there and miserable. Um, but I agree that I don't have a great sense of their goals. There are hints of like other possible outcomes um, that, I mean, you know, it goes very badly for PD, but the idea of like a successful reintegration of the two personalities and two sets of memories is, is one possible outcome. Um, and then you see, I mean, the reason that the in the finale that you are able to have the the Audis running around, I'm sorry, the innies running around in the outside world is because there's this technology that exists for, you know, the overtime, I forget exactly what it's called, but that, yeah. you know, f- for overtime, essentially, they can, you can actually turn the chip on on the outside. And so theoretically, they could become the Audi version of, you know, that, that they could just, the innie could just be the consciousness all the time, although that also seems very bleak and dark because that's still the death of another person. Um, so in that sense, it's hard for me to conceive of any ending for them that isn't some kind of reintegration or, or that they, you know, that it's just a really dark ending where they all, all the innies essentially die. Yeah, I think it was a good storytelling choice that they just decided not to show us, uh, the audience, showing them, you know, having this great plan. Uh, like all of a sudden they have a plan and I feel like they did that so that the the season finale could have that much more impact because we were not aware of what the actual plan was. We're not aware of what their goals are. But I also think that it, it makes sense with them being, you know, sort of blank slate and children, mm-hmm. um, both the idea that they would, uh, you know, entertain basically suicidal thoughts and realize this is all that their life is, but also have kind of a desire to to actually get out of there and fix it because with that same innocence and blank slateness, you know, would come with a certain amount of optimism. And Heli in particular goes through several stages and several ideas of trying to get out of there. And it's all very, you know, it makes her very endearing as a character. It just seems like it might be interesting if there was a character who, who's, who's um, take on this situation or whose philosophy is, you know, works not so bad. And this is the only life we're ever going to have. As soon as our Audi quits this job or retires, we're dead, in effect. I mean, John Turturro basically says that when um, when a Bird is retiring, that the John was just mentioning. But I, yeah, which is why it, it feels like they don't underscore that as much as you as I might have expected. But you know, but but this character's perspective was basically like, I don't want the program shut down. I want my Audi not to retire. You know, or. I- yeah, I think that they they covered that in the beginning when like Irving and Dylan, for instance, were both sort of 100% on board. But I feel like each character was given a very specific reason uh, to rebel. Like, you know, uh, Irving fell in love with Bert. 
Dylan learned that he had a child and then became obsessed with the idea of the fact that his life has no meaning because he doesn't remember the birth of that child. He doesn't remember anything about that child. Um, And then, you know, later learns he has a total of three children, which only further serves to inspire him to rebel. Um, So I feel like they're all sort of start out, you know, just sort of committed to the work, Irving and Dylan especially, and to some extent, Mark, and then they're all sort of given their own reasons to recognize, wait, we're missing out on real life on the other on the other side. It does seem to me that the the only way into a some kind of happy ending would be the idea of reintegration where their memories would somehow be merged with those of the Audi so that th- that they'd be one person who had both sides of them together. Yeah. I mean, it just seems like, like uh, for uh, Heli in particular, if she was like reintegrated, it just seems like that would be a, like the, the, the two yeah. sides of her are so different that it would be like yeah. two people dying and a completely new person coming into existence. Yeah. That's what's so great about it. I mean, it's fascinating to think of this person who was raised in this cult. You know, you look at, at, at kids who were raised within Mormonism, for instance, or even kids who were raised within Christianity raises hand like, you know, you 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 have this very deep set um, paradigm that has been instilled very purposefully and very intentionally in you. And the uh, the any heli has the benefit of not not having any of that. She, she isn't brainwashed. Uh, ironically, her Audi is the person who is brainwashed. Huh. Although we actually don't know a ton about the Audi Heli's personality. I mean, we know why she went in, um, but we don't know, like, to what extent is she, like, fully signed up, uh, you know, like, on board. Has she, like, drank the Kool-Aid about, like, Lumen and, and the sort of broader plans, or is she sort of grudgingly going along with it? And, um, and, and that I would also imagine that a lot of why Heli is the way she is at the beginning of the season is is vestiges of that person of her of the you know you know privileged and entitled heli being like what the fuck i am not going to put up with any of this um and and so there are i think also continuities there even though their agendas seem to be uh, you know completely at odds well also when she has that conversation with her dad in the bathroom he says thank you for doing this in a way that suggested to me that she wasn't like 100 percent gung-ho from the beginning about this that you know she yeah, there was some exactly. sort of, sort of obli- you know, sense of obligation but and also she was doing this reluctantly also in that same last episode there was a, a video of the audi heli uh saying that you know when i was a kid my dad would make me m- recite the 19 rules of you know egonism or whatever it was and i you know i i I resisted it or I didn't, you know, sorry, dad, I never did memorize them, she <laughs> says, something like that. And so yeah. you get a hint that maybe she might not have been completely on board for this. I think yeah. the video that she left her any basically like, I don't care about you. You are my, uh, you know, my servant, basically. I think that she has drunk the Kool-Aid. That's my personal Mm, theory. And I feel like she genuinely has a lot of tenderness for her dad. You know, she might, there might be a complicated relationship. She might not be a hundred percent on board, but even if she's 80% on board, she was still, it was still enough for her to betray herself, you know, the other side of herself, basically. That's true. And she, I mean, she actually said, you are not a person. Uh, yeah. To to the and, and and you know and she also knows that that the heli could kill herself. She tried to kill herself, and which would definitely kill her too. So that surprised you think me. That'd that be she, a wake up she, call. Like, exactly. You think that would be a wake up call? I don't know. I think there's a, at least a, a a a serious possibility that if she were to be killed, that they would be able to bring her back somehow. I mean, I, that's why I'm saying like with the that's what I think is. Maybe going on with Ms. Co- uh, with um, Ms. Casey. Although if they brought her back, I mean, I I think in that theory they would not view the the person brought back as the real Heli, right? In the same way, they yeah, don't re- yeah. view any Heli as the real Heli. I don't know if they discussed how long Miss Casey had been there, but I feel like it's possible that Miss Casey was like. Uh, an earlier version of the uh, procedure 
in which she lost her other side entirely. And so they had to like kill her off in the Audi world, you know, and sort of hide her in the Innie world uh, to explain that away. Yeah, I think what if is they, the, it, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just wondering what's the timeline with that? Because I, I, my initial thought is that Irving has been there longer than Ms. Casey had, but I'm actually, I'm not sure about that. But what were we going to yeah, say, John? Get, oh, well, you know, uh, it's funny when you have a science fiction show like this, where so many things are not known and mysterious, uh, that you have the possibility of saying, okay, yes, you know, they can, they can bring people back from death. And uh, my, my own prejudices in this sort of situation is that the more you do that, the less interesting it gets. Uh, you know, if you're saying not only can we, you know, split people's uh, memories in half, we we can raise them from the dead and we can plant your memories in someone else's body. And yes, we can also, uh, you know, unscrew our foot and stick it into our ear. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, in other words, the, the way you multiply, the more you multiply things like this, the less this is what happened to Lost. They kept multiplying things every season until it became a complete farrago. Uh, that had there was no way out uh, of the mess well, that they had. I, I, this is why I kind of agree with what Anthony said earlier that maybe this should have just been a one season thing. Because like, are they going to do another nine episodes of this? Are there going to be another eighteen episodes? Or like, you know, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not sure that you could extend this much beyond what we have without it getting too thrillery or too, yeah, like like too out there science fiction year or something, you know, without it's sort of shifting genres from what we, from what happened in season one, basically. Mm -hmm. Although I will say that I really liked the way they introduced the whole overtime device and that it's introduced first in this very limited capacity. And, and it's sort of terrifying the scene where you're just like, what is happening? Like, this is the first time we're seeing, you know, um, Audi Dylan and he is completely disoriented. And, um, and then, but that's also like setting the stage for the whole finale, essentially. And and so I think that there can be hopefully smart ways to kind of expand the world, expand the sort of technological capabilities without it feeling just sort of arbitrary or that like the show that we're watching a couple years from now is completely different from the one we started out with. Yeah, I'm interested in finding out if their work, the actual work that they do in those cubicles has any significance. Like if this was just a limited series, and everything was the same about it, I would say, okay, the, the, the work clearly has no meaning and they're just doing it to test this device because that's the purpose of these characters' existence is to test this device so this yeah. company can make they're a test, of money test off objects. it. Right, but it would be cool if they were actually doing something else and something insidious, you know, um, uh, but it, it'll be interesting to see if they do anything with that in the next season. I think they will because it does seem like the supervisors who have at least some sense of what the plan is are, are genuinely really invested in the the macro data refinement team uh, yeah. hitting quota. Yeah. I will say I read an interview with um, uh, Dan Erickson, and he was sort of indicating that they they have everything planned out. They know where this is going. Like, or, I mean, he said, like, you know, we might still change stuff, but it's not like they're making it up as they go along. Um, so, I mean, that gives me, I guess, what is, what is he going to say other than that? But, uh, <laughs> it's right. We're pants in the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What but, if he just said, do you have any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I am, you know, I don't know. It gave me a little more, I mean, just, just the fact, like I said that, yeah, that he wrote the pilot five, at least five years ago, you know, he's, so he's had, you know, he and the other writers have had lots of time to, you know, to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. So I, I hope it all pays off in the end. Um, but yeah, we're, we're pretty much out of time. So I think we should start wrapping this up. So, uh, so John, final thoughts on uh, watching season one? Well, I, I, as I say, I really enjoyed the whole season and I thought it ranked with some of the best shows, I, uh, uh, my favorite shows of the last 20 years. Uh, you know, it does also, but I, I'm not, you know, that doesn't mean to me that they couldn't completely uh, deflate this whole thing in the second season. And it does seem like a kind of show that 
I don't know. I mean, I can't see it going three, five seasons, something like that. It seems to me it, it would be reach a point of diminishing returns. This kind of story, really, I don't know that you can keep stringing it out indefinitely. Uh, but but I, uh, what they did this season, I thought, was remarkable, uh, wonderfully acted, uh, wonderful moments of, of, you know, human moments and funny, funny, funny things. Uh, you know, and, and creepy things. Uh, getting all those three things in one one show is pretty pretty crazy. So uh, I I recommend it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and yeah, I, I sort of I sort of imagine this this might be best with just season two, like tying everything up in season two, um, like you say. But uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, but so, Sarah, final thoughts? I think it says a lot that how you know as unsettling as this show is and in in many ways like triggering if you've ever had uh workplace experiences that were called tea um it says a lot that i still really want to see more like i I think that's just the highest praise especially for something that is in many ways you know borderline unpleasurable to to watch i mean there's definitely it's definitely can be a little anxiety inducing and i wouldn't want to binge it because i feel like it would just drain me to binge it (laughs) Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm very much on board for season two and I'm really fascinated to see where they're going to go with it. Yeah. Some of the scenes, I mean, we didn't even, there's a lot of stuff we didn't even talk about, but like the, uh, the waffle party and there's like so many like, Oh God, that was weird. (laughs) Yeah. There was some really weird, really intense stuff, uh, particularly toward the end of the season. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Anthony, final thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I just to echo everyone else, I think it's it's a really, really great show. And um, I can understand why some people might think and, and I had this thought myself before watching like this sounds just sort of bleak and depressing. But I think that even though it's incredibly dark thematically, it is so full of humor and life and so much attention and creativity just goes into so many of the different details that I, I honestly cannot recommend it enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I said, it's my favorite show in, you know, at least two years. Um, so I would definitely give it a try. I mean, uh, it is quirky enough that I think it's it's not going to be for everybody. But um, yeah, I, I just loved it. And uh, yeah, definitely curious to see what happens next. Um, and yeah, and so definitely we'll, uh, once uh, season two comes out, we'll definitely come back and talk about that. But let's wrap things up there for the moment. So we've been speaking with Anthony Ha, Sarah Lynn Mishner, and John Kessel. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Anthony Ha, Sarah Lynn Mishner, and John Kessel for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.